Good morning. Free speech. Wow. That's really under threat now. So free speech will always involve people saying things with which you profoundly disagree, that you think are deeply wrong and you wish they wouldn't say it. That is what free speech is. Free speech is hard. Free speech is not listening to people saying lovely things that you think, oh yes. No. Anyway, so big tech. Free speech is something that has challenged the finest minds since there has been speech or minds. Um, and big tech goes, yep, yeah, nailed it. We can do free speech. We know exactly what it's about. We know how to do it. Job done, end of. That is not the case, my friends. So let me start. I've got quite a lot to get through. Pin your ears back. It's going to be a bumpy ride. I'm going to start with the ash conformity experiment, which I love. I love this experiment. Um, you can look it up. It's been the results of this experiment have been replicated time and time and time again. Very simple. There, everyone in the test is an actor, apart from one young man in his early 20s, I think, who is the subject of the experiment. And it's very simple. There is a person in authority, in a white coat, who presents a series of lines. So there's a vertical line on a sheet of paper, and then there's a gap, and then there are three numbered vertical lines of varying heights, one of which is the same height as the initial line. And all that happens is there are, I think, six young people in a row, one of which is the subject of the experiment, the young man, I think he's third. And what happens is the first person needs to pick the line that is the same height as the test line. So you've got lines one, two and three. And in the first go, I think it's line two is the same height as the test line. Now the other two lines, they're not ridiculously obvious. So it's not like the test line is this long, it's the same line obviously, and then the other one like this and the other one like that. They're, it's harder than that, but if you're looking at it with a clear mind, without pressure, you can definitely see which line is the same height. So. Actor number one goes, and remember line two is the correct answer, and he confidently, he looks at it confidently, clearly says three. Then the next actor goes, and he looks at it, and confidently and clearly says three. And then we get to our young man who is the subject of the experiment, and he's looking puzzled and confused, but he goes, guys, it's two. Now, had the next actor gone two, probably this would all be fine. But the next actor, he looks at it and he confidently and clearly says three. So that all the actors are giving the same wrong answer and that's very important. And it's this guy that goes after the subject of the experiment who also gives the wrong answer. That's the one where you can almost see the certainty in his own individuality leech out from that young man and then the final actor goes and gives the wrong answer. And then the next line comes up and I think the correct answer is one, I can't remember. Anyway, the first actor again confidently clearly gives the wrong answer and the next guy does the same. And then we get to our young guy, the subject of the experiment, and he, he looks and he gives the wrong answer, an answer that he demonstrably knows to be wrong so that he can fit in with his peers. Now, is this because he just doesn't want to be different, he doesn't want to be picked on, he doubts himself, he doesn't have confidence in himself, he thinks maybe they know something he doesn't, there's all sorts of reasons, but peer pressure works. And I'm sure a lot of us would like to think, oh, I, I wouldn't do that. I'd 
continue to have the faith of my own convictions and believe the evidence of my own eyes and I would not succumb to peer pressure. Yeah, I don't think so. That's not how the experiment plays out time and time and time again. So we are incredibly susceptible to peer pressure. We are herd creatures. And we have big tech playing on that. So now, I need to just quickly run through the difference between a platform and a publisher. So big tech, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, that's what I mean by big tech. They maintain that they are platforms. Now, a platform is a tool or a conduit for people to speak. It does not decide what is said. It has no input as to the content, supposedly. So, for example, a telephone is a platform. Now, a newspaper is a publisher. Every single thing, every word, every picture in a newspaper has been decided upon and has been put in with editorial control. So a publisher decides everything or okays everything that goes on in it. So a newspaper is a publisher, a telephone is a platform, and Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, they maintain that they are platforms. Because if they were publishers, they would have to answer for the content that goes on them. So as platforms, what they mm -hmm. have to do is obey the law because everyone has to obey the law. So if someone puts something illegal on the platform, then that's, that can be removed because obviously something that's illegal is illegal everywhere, not, not just on a platform. So breaking the law is breaking the law wherever you do it. So now we come to Trump and Twitter. Now, I have to say that I think the speech that Trump made before the invasion of Capitol Hill was hugely reckless. And it was the equivalent of him sitting on a big pile of gunpowder and playing with matches. Now, he was chucked off Twitter for inciting violence with his tweets. Now, I don't know whether that is true or not, because I haven't seen his tweets. Um, I am, amazingly, no longer on Twitter. Um, but he may well have incited violence with his tweets. I don't know. And Twitter may well have done the right thing by expelling Trump. That's fine. I have no issue with that at all. People respect rules. If rules are applied universally and fairly, on the whole, people will go, yep, yeah, okay, and they will go along with rules. If they see rules being unfairly applied, then people have a problem. Injustice is a big deal. So just let's look at other tweets that Twitter has been okay with and has not expelled the person who has made the tweets. And I imagine the decision to expel Trump went right to the top, went right to Jack, who is the CEO of Twitter. So let's look at another tweet that we know Jack saw and we know his response to the tweet. So let's cast our minds back to June last year when the riots were happening in the States. And someone I shall call Colin with a blue tick tweeted his support for violence and promoted the violence and said that violence 
in this instance was absolutely justified that the other side basically had it coming and violent protests were something people should support. Now, one person's violent protester is another person's freedom fighter, is another person's terrorist. It is entirely a question of perspective and I'm, I'm not arguing with perspective and if Twitter were a publisher it would have the right to say I support these uh, acts but if we're saying that violence, the incitement of violence on a platform is against the law then it is against the law regardless of who is saying it. So what was at Jack's response to this tweet from Blue Tick Colin? Well, some days later, Jack responded and he said, here's $3 million towards your cause. Okay, example one, I think, of Twitter being a publisher and not a platform. There are more examples. The very obvious one that everyone's going on about is the Ayatollah Khomeini, the leader of Iran, who has called for the annihilation of Israel. He still has a Twitter account. And then we come to China. So the Chinese embassy in the US, this is, I find this abhorrent. They put forward a tweet congratulating themselves, really boasting on what they've done to the Uyghur women. Apparently now the Uyghur women are thinking with a great deal more clarity and are emancipated. Um, I think that was it's something to do with they're now free from being baby making machines. Now how have they achieved this wonderful freedom? They have been forcibly removed from their families and their homes. They have been put in internment camps for re-education. There is evidence from a leading human rights lawyer who has spoken at the United Nations that some of these women have been sterilised. So, boasting about how free and grateful these women are who had no choice in what's happened to them. You know, the only way you would get me to say I am grateful and I feel free after that had happened to me is if someone was holding a gun against my head or threatening to kill people I loved. So, I don't know about you, emancipation and freedom would not be my reactions to what has happened to the Uyghur woman, women if I were one of them. And then we come very briefly to China being invited, as it has been, to take its seat at the United Nations and to be able to um, rule on human rights. The thinking behind this from the United Nations is that you welcome the countries into the big tent and once they're in the big tent, they suddenly realise that brutalising and murdering their own population is wrong because, you know, they hadn't realised that before and it's because they're now in the United Nations that they'll stop doing that. So let's reward them by inviting them into the big tent before they've actually changed and then they will change and they will be much, much nicer to their populations. Okay, there is no evidence that this has ever worked. Next point. Twitter says that um, illegal activities are not allowed. Right. Last time I looked, having sex with children was not allowed. Paedophilia was a crime. Well, not on Twitter. Um, Paedophiles have rebranded themselves as minor attracted people. And boy, there are a lot of them tweeting about how great it is to have sex with children on Twitter. So, um, Twitter doesn't seem to remove that. There's plenty of these things. It's, you need to wash your eyes after you've seen it. And if you complain, they're still there. Okay, I now want to read an article. It's a short article, don't worry. It was published in the Sunday Times on January the 10th, 2021. So, recently. 
and it is it's the Times has been given permission to publish evidence that was submitted in a High Court case in London. Now the High Court is the highest court in England. It, its interpretation of the law you can't get any higher. And it is a well respected court on the world stage. And I want to read the evidence that was given by Professor Stephen Levine or Levine, I'm not sure how he says his name, I'm going to pick one, I'm going to go with Levine and if it's incorrect, I'm sorry. So this is the evidence submitted by Professor Stephen Levine. He is the Professor of Psychiatry at Case Western Reserve University in Ohio, who specialises in sex therapy and has treated transgender patients for the past 40 years in America. And he gave evidence that it was medically impossible, medically impossible to turn a girl into a boy and vice versa. It cannot be done. It is medically impossible. Many transgender people, he said, have sexual difficulties and suicide rates are high. Levine also said that black and Asian children, adopted children, girls and autistic youngsters were more likely to be diagnosed as trans in America. Contrary to trans persons' hopes that medicine and society can fulfil their aspiration to become a complete man or woman, this is not biologically attainable. It is a rare gender dysphoric young person who has no associated psych psychiatric diagnosis or symptoms suggesting one. Levine also told the court that because trans activists attacked critics as transphobic, few dare speak out. He said critical and cautious voices are shouted down as transphobic, hateful and engaging in conversion therapy. Such a climate has created an intimidating and hostile environment where silence and acquiescence are the inevitable consequence. It is left to those of us at the end of our careers who have nothing to lose to speak out, to voice our concerns. Okay, so that is pretty unequivocal. This is an expert on transgender saying that it is biologically impossible to genuinely change sex for mammals. Now, legally, it is possible, and I'll come to that in a moment, but right now I'm concerned with the, the factual statement that biologically changing sex is impossible. If you put that on Twitter, you will receive a lifetime's ban. You will be kicked off Twitter for hate speech. The truth is not hate speech and yet every day people are kicked off Twitter for speaking the truth. There are a lot of big names here, so there's Graham Linehan, Megan Murphy, uh, Kelly J, Keen Minchel and a lot of small names every day. So legally it is possible to change sex. So a man who wishes to identify as a woman can get a legal certificate that means that they will be recognised in law as the sex that they wish to live as. Now, I have absolutely no problem with that, but there are unforeseen consequences 
that need to be addressed and talked through by people who are arguing in good faith and tr that means they're trying to reach a resolution and you need to acknowledge that there are consequences to men legally identifying as women. Now I'm sure these can all be ironed out but if the merest bringing up of the fact that there might be problems for women with this marks you down as absolutely vile and deserving of the most horrendous abuse. So let me just very briefly touch on some of the issues that need to be addressed if men are legally defined as women. So sport. Male bodies that have been through male puberty competing against women. What you get is you get men who have been mediocre sportsmen in the field competing against men. They transition into women and compete against women and magically they are winning. Um, if there were no advantage then they would be remain mediocre and not suddenly be super winners. So sport I think is a problem that needs looking at. Right, crime statistics and data. When uh, men who are legally women now commit a crime, that crime is counted as a woman having committed it. And let me just give an example of the difference in crimes that men and women commit. So 30% of all female people in prison are there for having evaded their television licence. The uh, proportion of violent, of women being imprisoned for violent crimes is very small. There are more men in prison for sex offences than there are women in prison. So what we have now are men who are legally women committing violent crimes and sexual assaults and it's going down in the data and the statistics as having been committed by women. I think that's a problem for uh, the purity of data. And then of course if uh, these men who identify legally as women are then imprisoned, they are put in a woman's prison. And of course there have been sexual assaults and rapes of women by trans identified men. Then we come to um, a medical problem. So for example, um, on the radio at the moment, the NHS is advertising for blood plasma donors and these donors must be men. Now this is on the NHS blood donor website that the blood plasma that you get from women contains too many antibodies and it can cause a severe or possibly fatal reaction in a recipient. So it is vitally important that the blood plasma is from men. Now supposing you are a woman who is legally a man, a trans man they're called, and you don't know this and your medical records show you as a man and you've maybe taken testosterone, you've got a beard, you've got a big Adam's apple, you've got a deep voice, you've had chest surgery, you look, you look like a man and your medical records say that you are a man and you don't know that your blood plasma as a woman would be harmful and you donate out of the goodness of your heart your blood plasma I think that's a problem and I just I think that needs addressing. Now on Twitter there was a uh, female lawyer and she specialised I think in international law but she would tweet with great clarity, um, very rationally very to the point about the issues that I've brought up and, and many more. And of course anyone who tweets about this gets 
the most incredible abuse. And when, when it happens to me, I, I actually think it's got nothing to do with me. It, this is just people showing their damage. And I, I actually feel quite sorry for them because I don't think emotionally healthy people would say such things because they, what they say is, for example, um, I hope you die. I hope your kids get cancer and die painfully. Um, all sorts of stuff like that. And you, you put up with it because they've couched it in such terms that they're not actually inciting violence, they just wish that you die and you, you take it on the chin. But this lawyer, she got something rather different. What she got was a trans right activist with quite a large following who said, if you continue to tweet like this, I am going to publish your name and your home address on Twitter for all their hostile followers to see. And so direct message me and I will prove to you that I've got your name and address. Now I think that's a pretty big threat, I think that's blackmail, and I think that is illegal. So this lawyer complained to Twitter about this, and Twitter said that there was no violation of the Twitter rules and no action would be taken. Well, publisher or platform, what do you think? So now I come to the very last thing, which is Parler and Big Tech and what they've done to Parler. So Parler was a platform that tended to attract the right. So Twitter is left, Parler is right. And because Trump was kicked off Twitter, it was, and Twitter's stock price, or whatever it's called, I think it, I read somewhere it went down 4%. Anyway, so he was kicked off and it was possible that he might go to Parler and Parler might start doing a lot better. So big tech, Amazon, Google, Apple got together and they pulled the rug out from under Parler and Parler has gone. The reason behind it was they said that there is a lot of right-wing incitement to violence on Parler and it needed to be shut down. That may well be true, I don't know. What I do know is there is a lot of left-wing incitement to violence on Twitter because I've seen it. I used to come across these um, um, people and I would follow them for a while until they blocked me because they check their followers quite regularly and if you don't look the right sort they block you. But before I was blocked what I would see a lot of is they're saying direct message me if you want the names and addresses of Republican voters in your area. You know what to do. Winky emoji lols. If you can't wait till then just duff up anyone who's got, um, it wasn't duff up, it was rough or, or attack. Anyone who's got um, a Republican sticker in their front yard. So, absolutely, and there were loads of these. Um, so I would say that Twitter is by no means innocent of what it's accused parlour of being. And I think this shows that they are publishers and not platforms because they don't, without fear or favour, apply the law equally. There are decisions made about what content to allow and what content not to allow, regardless of whether they break the law. And I think this makes them a publisher. If you are a publisher, then you are subject to rigorous controls and that of course would end Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. I am no longer sure that that would be a bad thing. I think something really big needs to change. Free speech is under attack. Everybody needs to wake up. Anyway, I'm going to do a lovely horse video soon when the weather's better. So thank you for watching. Bye-bye.